about science today, the natural world, our exploration from some of our very own. And the first shout out that I want to give is to you guys because our science audiences are the best. Man, College of Science, you guys come out. That's awesome. Yeah. We love this. This full hall is amazing and we have a great like exploration to show for you today. Let's get started. I want to welcome to the stage my co-host and friend, Bill Hayborn. Whoa! <laughs> oh my gosh. I never traveled solo in, so oh I've got friends. Well, I've been, I've been waiting to share the stage with you for a long time. And now I get to share the stage with you and someone else. This is uh, this is Sarabi. Oh my gosh! Sarabi is a, a Burmese python from Southeast Asia. Wow! And I think she'd go great with your dress. I know. Look at that! <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, she is beautiful. So she is part of a program that, that is the Animal Ambassadors. Is that right? Tell yeah. us about that. Yeah. So SUU Animal Ambassadors. It's a student club here on campus, um, partially sponsored by the biology department and the College of Science. And we use live animals as a way to connect with the public about nature and science and conservation and all those sorts of things. So animals are just a great hook to get people excited about science. So yeah, literally a hook. Right? She was she was getting a little fresh with me with her tail down anyway. So I had to I had to hold on to her tail so that she didn't put it places where I didn't want. It. Oh my gosh, look at it. she's she's really getting there. Oh look at yeah, this. She's oh my not gosh. shy. Now, tell me more about this, about the python. Yeah, so, um, so Sarabi is, uh, is still rapidly growing. Yeah. Um, so this species of snake, they're the third largest species of snake on the planet right now. Uh, they can top out at about 20 feet long. So Sarabi was actually a, a pet of someone in the Salt Lake City area who bought her as a little hatchling at like a reptile expo and then got home and did some research and realized I don't have, I, I'm not, I don't know what to do with the 20 foot snake, right? right? So then he reached out and said, I did, I did something really dumb, I bought the snake, I don't want it, when you give it a home? So she came to live here, so I don't know what we're gonna do with her when she's 20 feet long. Maybe she'll live in your office, you know, that's okay. <laughs> Can she play drums? She, uh, maybe, uh, maybe. <laughs> Well, this tape some mallets to her, and she can crawl across your marimba exactly. or something. Exactly, it could be a really cool sound. Now, how long is she about right now? So she's pushing eight feet now. So okay. she's she's getting fairly sizable, and she weighs um, about thirty-five pounds. Oh my god! So um, yeah, and she's. And how old is she? She is. Oh, I have to look at her data sheet. I think we've had her for four years, okay. if I remember right. Okay. Okay. So, and what um, does she eat? Um, small children. Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> Uh, no, she, um, so in the wild, they'll eat basically anything that will fit in their mouth, which may include things like deer and pigs. Um, here on campus, she eats rats. Oh, okay. So, yeah. yeah. And this concept where, you know, somebody has gotten her for a pet and then realized that they can't take care of it, that happens quite a bit, right? Oh my gosh, we, yeah, we, um, very few of the animals that we use for our programming are things that we've specifically sought out. Almost all of them come from some sort of a rescue situation, right. and we turn down far more than we accept. Um, it's just you know, like like dogs and cats, reptiles get sort of cast off too, and yeah. there's a huge you know need for um, for fostering and that sort of thing. But we can't take them all. Yeah. So. And what about snake handling? I mean, how do you learn how to handle a snake? Like, <laughs> like she's wrapped around your neck right now, and I'm like, oh no. So a snake this size, you don't really have to handle. Like, she just kind of handles you, right? Yeah. So she's she's just going to sort of hang on. And, and it's um, okay that she's like wrapping around your neck. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> oh, oh. She's squeezing a little bit, and she's mucking up my mic there. But you want to you hold her? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, perfect, perfect. Yep, just hold right there. There you go, there you go. Is somebody getting this on camera? You go. <laughs> Let's hear it for Lynn. A total snake wrangler now, Lynn. You did awesome. Wow, thank you. We'll get you some counseling. Okay. It's, it's Bill's 12 Steps to Loving Snakes. Okay. And you are already on like step 10. Okay. So you're doing awesome. Well, it's amazing. She's dry. I wasn't expecting Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, people have this misconception that snakes are slimy, but 
I always tell children a slimy snake is a sick snake. Oh. So they're very smooth. And so I think sometimes kids get smooth and slimy sort yeah. of confused, yeah. which is very, very dry. Yeah, she's very, very smooth dry. skin. So they're actually endangered in the wild, oh. which is interesting. Um, because uh, of their skins. They're harvested for the leather trade. Yeah. Um, but Burmese pythons are actually an invasive species here in the U.S. Oh. down in the Everglades. Oh my so there are several thousand of these things roaming around the Everglades, eating their way out of house and home. So. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to recover from that. That was amazing. <laughs> amazing. Cool. Well, I think it's time to get started with our first show. And totally. that is going to be from McKay Stephenson. Yeah. So uh, if you guys don't know Dr. Stephenson, uh, a longtime member of the SUU chemistry faculty. And uh, he, he's really good at what he does. But there's sort of a long history here because his dad was a very well-known and well-loved chemistry teacher at Cedar High School who also did sort of this crazy blowing stuff up sort of thing. So he comes at this um, very naturally. I think it's in his genes. So, um, Well, yeah. with that, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Case Stephenson. <laughs> Okay, all right, you said my name's McKay Stevenson. I teach chemistry here. Uh, do that most of the week. So today we're gonna show you the fun side of chemistry. And since I teach, I really don't wanna teach. I just want to have some fun. So I'm not gonna do a whole lot of instruction. In fact, what I'm gonna try to do is see how many demos I can get done in my allotted time and stay alive. So if you have questions, I encourage you to take one of our great chemistry courses here, or you could find me after. Uh, I'll do a little bit of instruction, but I found, well, if you want to know the real reason is I've gotten older, I can do one thing at a time, and it's getting to be just stand. And standing and talking is getting difficult, but I'll give you some, uh, uh, a little bit of background. Uh, one of the things that I need to tell you is when I put these on, you may, well, no, you will be hearing something loud. And so that is the signal uh, as a warning that if you get... Uh, upset by loud sounds, you're going to hear a loud sound. And so uh, I encourage everyone to cover their ears because it really, really will be loud. I think I've got an especially loud mixture. So let's just start it off with a bang. So there's my warning to you. And now you know I'm not a liar, so. Okay, it would be a science demo without a bunch of smoke. Now it has been about 10 years since I've evacuated a building. So I'm hoping to keep that streak going. Last time I did it, it was on the test day and people ended up missing their test. They were excited, the teachers were not. So, anyway, hopefully I always look up to make sure that there is not a fire extinguisher up there. So, let me see how far I can throw a cup. Oh. Hey, good catch, you wanna put that on your head? There we go. Oh, work on my aim here. Oh, there we go, yay! Just do it one more time. And in reality, this isn't chemistry. This is physics, but I went first, so. Let's see how far we can get one of those to go in the light. There we go, look at that. Okay, so that's fun, but uh, we can do some more exciting things. We just had Halloween. I went and caught a ghost. So I just need to put some water in here and the ghost will come out for us. Okay, let's see if I can make a bigger ghost. There we go. Okay, I've got some water up here. Anyone want to place bets where the water is just to prove that I've got water? Okay. There's the water right there. Other cups are empty, so let's see if you can keep your eye on the water. Anyone guess where the water is? Is it in this one? Oh, not in that one. 
Um, where did the water go? We don't know. Okay. So chemistry is cool. So I've got something uh, cool to show you. Or maybe it's chemists are cool. So I, I got a skill that very few people have. I can blow up a balloon with my finger. I just have to hold my breath. I mean, not hold my breath. Hold my breath and push it on my finger. There we go. Yay. I can also make it disappear. And like Mary Poppins. There we go. Make it reappear. Yay. Make it disappear. There we go. Okay, so what I got in here is actually liquid nitrogen, which is super, super cold. And uh, I actually am a chemistry teacher because I got kicked out of juggling school. And so I can juggle with two balls, but that Ooh. is about it. When I went to three, I broke the ball. Oh, that one bounces. And that one doesn't. Last time I did this, it bounced, and it went right towards the projector, over the projector, and landed in the audience. So that's not going to break. I'm not going to attempt that again. But yes, liquid nitrogen. It's super cool. You can pour it on yourself. It doesn't hurt. Pour it in a bunch of hot water. And it makes a mess. Okay, I'm gonna let that bubble for a bit. So I'm gonna move on to, instead of cool chemistry, uh, I've also been called hot, but that's usually when I set myself on fire that you'll see in a few minutes. So, there we go. Ooh, I think I got some of that wet. So how do you make a tissue dance? Put a little boogie in it. There you go, so. Uh, uh, yes, we're good at bad jokes. Do you want to hear a joke about sodium? Nah. How about potassium? Okay. How about oxygen potassium? Okay. Did you know that oxygen and magnesium are dating? OMG! So, anyway, never trust an atom. They make up everything, so. There we go. Actually, if we could have the lights dimmed, that would be awesome. So we're going to do some fun things with fire. No, we got dragon's breath here. Oh, we've got the goblet of fire. Reach in. Harry, did you put your name in that goblet? <laughs> Dumbledore said calmly. I don't know if you guys follow those memes, but uh, it's not what he did in the book. And we have green. And now that we are past Halloween, I usually wait till after Thanksgiving, but I'll make an exception for you so we can make the flaming Christmas colors. Okay, this is not loud, but it is startling. If it works, I'll be startled if it works. And this is the part where people say, man, you're hot. Yes, I am. <laughs> so. Ooh. Bubbles, bubbles, bubbles. I love bubbles, 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 bubbles. There we go. Let's get a lot of bubbles. One more time. If you smell the flesh, that's okay. It doesn't really hurt. Uh, the burning hair is just a benefit of uh, this job. Don't have to worry about shaving. So, there we go. Woo okay.
Let's have the uh, lights come back on. Oh, I should turn that on. <laughs> there we go, okay. Well, my time's about up, so hopefully you remember what I said from the first. We're gonna send this out with a bang. Snake, do you want to try on the fire? No! Oh. <laughs> Absolutely not. I draw the line at snakes, I think. But I think maybe we have some more critters. Yeah, yeah bring okay, one out. Start. So we're, we have a, basically we have three different shows for you, and in between we're gonna share an animal. So Bill's gonna bring in something else. I don't know, I feel like I need one of my drums here to do that. Wow, okay. Well, welcome back, Bill and friends. Who yes. is this? This is Mercedes. Mercedes. Mercedes oh my gosh. Great name. That is a great name. So um, Mercedes, uh, oh, she's uh, she's getting friendly there with that big old tongue. She's a great kisser. Oh my god. No, are you gonna make me get a no, kiss? No. By this <laughs> so this is Mercedes. Mercedes is an Argentinian black and white tegu. T-E-G-U, Tegu. Tegu, okay. Um, and so you can see this beautiful black and white pattern That's skin. Incredible. I'm gonna yeah. give her a little pet yeah. there. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's, not, it's like bees. It's it like, bees. like bees. It's pretty amazing, right? Wow. So this is another one of these critters that has been exploited um, for the leather industry. Oh, People right. love to have boots and handbags and belts and whatever right. made out of tegu skin. Um, and so they are um, pretty endangered in the yeah. wild. And you said tegu is from where? They're from South America. Okay, South yeah. America. Yeah, South America. And um, yeah, one of the, the larger lizards in the, uh, in the Americas. Look at her go. Yeah, she's, a, she's a little nervous. These, bright, these bright lights I know. make her sorry, a little nervous. Sorry, Tegu. And right. that forked tongue, that's now that, what type of animal has that? Because she's got an incredible fork. Okay, yeah, wide yeah, yeah. Fork. So, um, so her tongue is very much like a snake's tongue with that fork, right? And they actually have um, bi-directional um, smell and taste with oh, that tongue. Oh, okay. So they can actually track prey by sending that tongue out and then they can pick up differences in, in molecule concentrations and they can figure out which direction a prey animal went wow. and, uh, and track it in the wild. Okay. So um, omnivores. Oh, they, omnivores. So, yeah, so they'll eat just about anything, anything that will fit in their mouth. Um, but you know, she loves things like eggs. Um, if they encounter a nest of baby birds or baby rodents, that's a, that's a, a great treat yeah. for Tegu. And about how old is she? She is uh, about 10 years old now. Wow. So she was, um, she was the pet of a former student who was moving out of state and couldn't take her. And so, you know, the same sort of thing. Like, hey, I have this lizard. Will you, will you give her a home? And, and Tegus can sometimes be um, a little cantankerous. Yeah. But Mercedes has always just been really, really chill. So she is just a, a great outreach animal. And, and when they're cantankerous, what does that what does that mean? Are they do are they noisy? Are they like violent? They can, yeah, they can be um, they can be quite aggressive actually. They have a mouth clear full of fairly large teeth. Oh, okay. And then this big long tail, which they can, um, they can whip. Yeah. Whip. So they've got you know a couple of great defenses. But Mercedes loves people. Oh so, my gosh. Yeah, and now how you handle the animals all the time and do you have the sense that they know you and they recognize you 
know. I mean, it depends on the it depends on the animal. I definitely think that Mercedes is um, intelligent enough that she can pick out individuals. Yeah. Um, you know, when she, when she sees you coming toward her cage, she's like, "Hey, did you, you know, did you bring me a treat?" Yeah. And so she'll perk up and, and come to the lid, and wanting to get out. And what do you take so. take for treats for her? Um, boiled eggs. That's one of her oh. absolute favorites. Oh, that's so yeah, cool. she loves boiled eggs. And this this sort of blown out cheek. Kind of area is that unique to this breed? Um, so it's a it's a feature of tegus. Okay. So there's several different species of tegus, but they all have these big jowls. It's you know sort of oh, like. Oh, and they're a, soft. They're kind of soft. Yeah. You want you want to feel it? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh wow. So it's yeah. kind of like a grandpa. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's like um, kind of, yeah. You know the, the the waddle down there. So um it's uh, it's fat storage. So um so where they live, it's you know a temperate environment. So there's going to be seasonality. And so there's not always going to be food available. So she'll store some fat down here in the jowls as well as in her tail. Okay. So during times of, you know, low food, then she lives on those fat reserves. Oh my gosh. Just like and your grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> and last question. So it, I tend to think of these animals as being really liking a warm climate. So how do they handle our winters? What do you do for yeah, them? Yeah, so, um, so she has to be indoors all year round. They don't hibernate. Okay. Um, and so yeah, she has a, a, a spot over in the science center where she lives and we keep her nice and toasty. Well, out of the year. and then back to the animal ambassadors. If anybody in the room it, it wants to get involved or do take student volunteers, how does absolutely. that work? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I know that there are a bunch of ambassadors here in the room. Actually, shout out, who are my animal ambassadors? Wave your hands. Oh, there yes. they are. There's a bunch of them here. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, it's a student club. They can sign up. So just email me. Um, there is some training they need to take part in and that sort of thing, but we'll get them signed up. Um, it's one of the larger clubs on campus. We typically have about 80 students who are oh, involved in the club. Okay, so, amazing. Yeah. Well, perfect. Well, I think with that, we will say goodbye to Tegu and welcome our next guest to the stage, which is Brandon Wiggins. Tell us about our physics genius, uh, Brandon Wiggins. Dr. Wiggins, your quintessential nerdy physicist, <laughs> who we all love dearly. He's, he's amazing. So, um, so Brandon, um, like Dr. Stephenson, actually, is uh, an alumnus of, of SUU. Um, so finished his bachelor's degree a few years ago and then went away and did a PhD. And he's worked in really illustrious uh, places on various research projects. And you know now he's now he's back to dazzle us with uh, with his physics tricks. So okay. Let's well, great. Well, let's let turn the stage over to him and the time over to him, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Dr. Brandon Wiggins. <laughs> So my lapel keeps moving here, so let's see if I can. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Sorry, you have to rebalance. Can you hear me? Okay, okay. Okay, um, of course we brought, of course we brought um, old Bessie, is what we call her. No, the Tesla coil. Um, and uh, this is an a invention I think that's attributed to Nikola Tesla. Um, not sure if they were around before him or no. Fairly simple construction. Um, Nikola was interested in something very specific, though, with his Tesla coils. Um, he had this idea of um, wireless electricity that he thought was going to be really exciting. What's this? It really is. I promise there's nothing uh, different or odd about that. It's just a fluorescent light bulb, and the way they work with electricity goes in one end. Electrons crash around the gas here, it lights up, and then it goes out the other end. And usually the way these work best is if they're plugged in. And that's kind of a, a downer because it turns out that takes cords and those types of things. And one of the things that Tesla was after as early as 100 years ago was trying to find a way to communicate electrical power wirelessly. And uh, we do see echoes of this now today in like wireless charging and those types of things. But Nikola Tesla was into it before it was cool. And um, I'm going to kind of show you this. Could we actually get the house lights in just a minute here? We're just going to set up. This is Gret Zollinger. He's, he is um, a physicist here at Southern Utah University, and I invited him along because when you see what this um, piece of equipment can do, see why you need two of us um, just to kind of be safe. Um, I always kind of work in pairs with it. So I'm grateful that um, he is lending his considerable expertise. Um, we're just going to tackle this together. Oh, we're going to do this? OK. All right, here's old Bessie. Let's go ahead and get the house lights. When you are ready, go ahead and take the lights down. Marvelous, marvelous. Okay, here we go. Now you're going to hear something. Um, are you okay? Okay, here we go. 
don't know if you can see, I know you're looking at the Tesla coil right now, but if I bring this light bulb within a certain distance of the Tesla coil now, can you see what's going on? This is not plugged into anything. Actually, it kind of is. It's plugged into me, and I'm plugged into the ground, and there's a lot of electrons on the ground, and there's a circuit that's actually happening right now, facilitated by the Tesla coil. The issue, of course, is, you know, while this apparatus seems a lot of fun, is that um, if you turn it on full blast, right, you can see that wouldn't work well around the family cat. And so this is one of the reasons why it's not like a household appliance. It's just something cool, and we can do some cool demos with it. We're making lightning today with um, this Tesla coil. This is the second one that we've um, been graced with on campus. This has been purchased by, for us by the SE STEM Center. It's the second generation Tesla coil that has double the power of the former one. And uh, we intend to leverage all of that, like, today. So she's dis disengaged yet. Yeah, let's go ahead and do this one first, maybe. All right. It's not ready. Lightning needs something to strike. And electricity always likes to move in a circle. And so we're going to give it that opportunity. Electrons, electricity is no more than just moving electrons. Electrons going around in a circle. Electrons are going to leave the Tesla coil in the form of a lightning bolt. They're going to connect to this electrode. We have a cord that's connected to this electrode that carries electricity away back into the wall. And so electricity is happy because it's um, going in a circle. So anyway, let's go ahead and give it a shot. It's going to be a little loud, not because it's scary loud, it's because it's annoying loud. It's lightning after all, right? modulate the frequency is what we're saying. That lightning bolt, which looks continuous to your eyes, is actually breaking and reforming many, many times a second. That's creating a vibration in the air, which your ears are interpreting as a tone. Um, and uh, you can exploit that to um, make music. And so um, what we're going to do for you right now is we're going to do a little musical number here uh, with our SUU Tesla coil. This is more up Lynn's alley. Um, so we're hoping that um, we can do the concept justice, I guess. But Now, usually, we actually have a keyboard that goes with the Tesla coil, um, and you can actually play it like you would a musical instrument. I'm not that talented, and that, you don't play either, do you? No. So, so we have a computer that's going to issue the signal that a, that a keyboard would have signaled to the Tesla coil, and that's going to kind of be the way that we're going to operate today. So let's go ahead and just let's go in here. Okay. All right, you guys ready for this? This is an obscene amount of fun. Okay, all right, here we go. Excellent. Okay, ready for this? And three, two, one. that today, but what we will be doing is something a little bit, something that I know that he did because um, he talked about it later on. The reason why um, birds on a wire don't get electrocuted has to do with the fact that, um, uh, they're not touching two wires, right, I think we all know that, really high voltage electricity is moving closer to these birds probably than the shirt is on our own backs, and yet people aren't getting electrocuted, right, As we, birds aren't getting electrocuted. We're going to kind of create a similar situation. I have a fluorescent bulb. You can't really see it really well right now, but it, there's a cord that's carried, that's uh, attached to the back end that Rhett Zollinger has permanently attached. And uh, he's done that because he doesn't want me to die today. Um, it's really good if you don't make the evening news. Not today, yeah. Everyone dies, right, but not today. Okay, yeah, anyway. 
So it turns out um, we're going to give the electricity a clear choice today. I'm going to hold this with my bare hands. You can see that I'm standing on the ground the way Nikola Tesla probably would have as well, because he can't float in the air like I can't. And um, the idea would be we're going to allow the electricity to connect to this light bulb here. We're going to give it a choice. It can either flow through me, in which case this is a shorter event, and you'll be ushered out the back door. And please call 911 as you step over my smoldering body on the way out. Or um, electricity will be carried away through the cord. And the bet here is, is that the electricity will prefer the path of least resistance, just like in Pocahontas. Reverse to the smoothest course, that one. Yeah, we're going to hope that that trend holds with electricity as well. Okay, all right. And um, <laughs> every time I do this, I promise that it's going to be the last time I do it. Do you guys have things like that in your own life? Yeah, I know. Uh -huh. It's like a parasitic habit that I have. Okay, here we go. This is a really good sign. The light is not stopping at my hand, which means it's going through the cord. That's great. Okay, here we go. I'm going to start at low voltage, because if I get zapped, it's really better to like, get zapped with not a lot. You ready? You have seen um, or heard of what are called Faraday cages, or you probably know people that keep some of the electronics in Faraday cages in the unlikely event that we get, that seriously to be get struck by an EMP, because we're like number one on the target list for enemies, right? So like, um, what we have here is an example of a Faraday cage. All we have, is it chicken fence that we have? I think it's chicken fence, yeah. Um, but it's made of aluminum, aluminum's a good conductor. Um, and what conductors do is they shield or block electric fields. And um, this is what the principle that a Faraday cage uses in hopes to shield your electronics from a very strong electrical pulse is the sort of the, the hope here in the concept. What we're going to do is kind of do this um, uh, Penn and Teller-like trick, really, <laughs> using um, this, uh, this Faraday cage or Faraday shield is really more what it's like here. What Rhett's doing right now is he's connecting our Faraday shield um, to ground, which means when electricity reaches it, it will prefer to go out the cord um, and into the wall rather than through a person, which, as you know, is probably more exciting, but is an awful lot of paperwork. So we'll try to avoid it today. You set? OK, so what I'm going to do actually for that's putting on rubber gloves. That's always a good thing to do, by the way, when you're to be safe. He has safety goggles, so he's safe now. Um, nothing can hurt you, right? Okay, all right. All right, are we set here? Okay. Do you want to start up close? Go in. Okay, all right. I do have to say something I've never Ready? Okay. Well, we're gonna turn it on, kind of. Um, get behind you. That doesn't seem like a good idea. Oh, this is cozy. That's right. Okay. Here we go. Should we do this? It powers up. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it works. We're still alive because, yeah, conductors work. We'll have, 
We're going to end with a bang as well. We're grateful that you indulged us for this long. Um, science lectures should never overstay their welcome, and we do all the time. McKay has generously donated to the cause here. These are not just balloons, of course, because McKay prepared them. Um, they ha he told me there's something in them that's special. Oh, he's actually going to feed. You're going to feed this? Oh, OK. Uh, what do I do with this other explosive? I've always loved balloons, but not that kind. Yeah, okay, all right, here we go. Try this here. Okay, guys. This is why the administration loves me so much, just so you know, is um, they say I'm a lot of paperwork, and I don't know what that means. I assume that's a good thing. But. Okay, grab this here. Okay. Let's see if I can. Oh, your other one's right up here. Two or three of these, it turns out. Sorry, we're almost there. Grateful for your patience. And we are set. Okay, all right. You are plugged in. Do you want to do the feeding? I'll do the zapping. We call this one feeding the goat to the T-Rex. Okay, here we go. We are set. <laughs> Woo -hoo! There was something special in there. Yeah, we're ready. This is good. He's told me that that one was louder. I don't know what that means. Should we try it? It's just chemistry. Just chemistry. What, what harm could it do, right? What the bang, we're gone. Thank you so much for indulging us. See, all right, thank you so much, Dr. Wiggins. That was amazing. Oh my gosh, I felt that last explosion. Like, don't tell anybody that we're doing this today. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's so cool. Oh my gosh, I think I want to take one of those balloons home. They are definitely special, that's for sure. Well, Brandon mentioned that this Tesla coil is part of our STEM center. It's a generation two. Um, I think a lot of people know about our STEM center, but can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, absolutely. So the SUU Center for STEM Teaching and Learning um, originated on our campus back in 2014. So I actually had the opportunity to be the original director, which I did for a number of years. And uh, Dr. Elaine Vickers from chemistry is now directing the center. So um, the, the mission of the center is to take science education out to the world, out to the, the greater community here in Southern Utah. So um, it's been a, a great resource for our campus because we get to buy kind of cool toys and whatever, have some additional resources. But it's really about um, encouraging underrepresented populations to get involved in, in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. So Elaine and her team do phenomenal work over there. And is it a space that's open all the time? Do you make an appointment to go visit? Yeah, so if you, if you are interested, uh, I hope this is all right, Elaine, just go visit them. They're on the third floor in the Geosciences building. So they do have a physical space on campus now, and it's staffed um, you know, all day, every day. They do um, Wonder Wednesdays. Uh, I think it's from 4 to 6 on Wednesday afternoons. And uh, it's, you know, it's geared toward kids, but they wouldn't turn away college students who want to go and you know, figure out what the, the cool science phenomenon is of the day. So go check it out. They're, they're a great team. Great. And I think you have one more I thing do. to show I us. Do. One more critter. I can't wait. Uh, okay. And I know we wanted a little bit of a clear space on the table for this one. So I'm excited. What is it going to be? Oh my okay. gosh. In a cart? This one requires a cart. Wow. And, and bigger muscles than I have, but I'll, I'll do my best here. Do you need help? I think I, I think I got him. Whoa. <gasps> Whoa. Oh my goodness. Bring him on in. It's a him? It's a him. Oh my gosh, yes. Look at this guy. Tell this us all about it. Yeah, so this is, this is Tater. Tater? And, and Tater. So, Talk to 
name Tanner? Well, that's a good question. So, um, so my kids named him when we when we oh, first got him. So. He, um, he was found roaming a street in St. George. What? And somebody, uh, and somebody thought he was a, a desert tortoise, which is a native species, right? And a, a threatened species, protected. So they picked it up, called Division of Wildlife, said, hey, we found this, this desert tortoise. They went to get him, and they realized it's not a desert tortoise. It's, um, it's one of these guys. This is a sulcata tortoise. Okay, or a sulcata. Sulcata. Okay. Or a spur thigh tortoise, because they have these big scales back here on their thighs. Okay. Um, they're from Sub-Saharan Africa. And, uh, How did he end up in St. George? It's, you know, he swam and then hiked. No, um, they're, so they're super common in the pet trade, which is ridiculous. Oh. So they're the third largest species of tortoise on the planet. Oh. They can get up to 200 pounds. Wow. So Tater currently weighs about um, 70 pounds, so wow. somewhere around there. Um, and and still, still growing. Still growing, yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll live 80 years and you know, weigh 200 pounds, but they breed like rabbits in captivity. Oh, really? So they'll have you know, dozens and dozens of eggs at a time, and the little babies, when they hatch out, are just adorable. They're oh like, my you know, gosh. as big as a silver dollar, and pet stores sell them really cheaply, yeah. and so people buy them, and then they don't realize, it's like the big snake I had out earlier, yeah. right? They don't realize what they're getting into. Now, so, what, what is his habitat like here? He must need space. Yeah, so, um, so they come from a, you know, a tropical area of the world, so, um, during the summer, they do live outdoors, and so I, I have a cinder block wall around my backyard, and so they go in, and live in my backyard all summer. And then um, in the winter, when it gets cold, so sometime in October, then they have to come back to campus. And so we have um, facilities for them to live over in the science center. Um, but, you know, they're big animals, and they, you know, we have to get them out every couple of days so they can, you know, get exercise and whatever, so. And anyway, what, so, is, what so, do they eat? They're, um, they're herbivores, mostly grass feeders. Oh. So they're, they're grazers, just like zebra and wildebeest and all these other things that live on the plains of Africa. Which is another problem in captivity, because people want to feed them like lettuce, yeah. you know, which is like, Not. It, it's like a candy bar to yeah. a, a tortoise, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, so in, the, in the winter, we actually buy really high quality grass hay, and that's, oh. and that's what they eat. So the folks over at Intermountain Farmers know us really well. Not because we keep cows, but because we keep tortoises. So. Oh my gosh, okay. And what are some of the things about uh, this species that are really unique to it? You mentioned the on the back. Yeah, so, um, so uh, you want to look at a tortoise's backside? I mean, sure, <laughs> why not? I mean, everything else today. So, so they have these big, um, these big spurs back here on the Oh yeah, so they're kind of like spikes yeah, back yeah, yeah. here. So, it's, it's, yeah. so it, when their legs are drawn in, that's the only exposed part of their leg. Oh, and so it provides some protection from predators. And of course, when they weigh 200 pounds, they have no predators, yeah. right? But as, as juveniles, they're eaten by um, basically any sort of African predator that you can, um, that you can think of. He, he likes to get around. He does like to get around, absolutely. And how would you characterize his personality in comparison to maybe other tortoises that you have? Oh yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, Sulcatas are kind of jerks. Oh. <laughs> um, they, um, they, they definitely recognize people. Um, so we have four of these, and um, we have another one that's, um, that's about the same size that hates my daughter, and we don't know why. So um, when she goes out into the backyard and he hears her voice, he'll come down off the hill and find her and seek her out, and he pulls his legs and his head in his shell, and he rams her legs. Oh my gosh. So we, we have no idea why he hates her, but he does. Um, some other species of tortoises are, are they're very friendly and, and even seek out affection, but these guys don't. They're like, feed me or get out of my space. Oh my so, goodness. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. And do you, do you have a sense of how old he is? Um, so we were guessing he was probably around three when he came to campus um, eight years ago. Mm, so, ah. And uh, they live, I imagine, a long, long like time. Like 80 years. 80 years? Yeah. Oh my gosh, wow. So, um, yeah, if, if anybody out there wants to, my job in a decade or so when I retire, the tortoises will still be here, so. Yeah. Well, and then just to kind of close up about the, the kinds of animals, we've seen three, but you have lots of other different kinds of animals. Can you give us a little more of a rundown about some of the other things you have? Yeah, so most of the critters that we use um, are reptiles, and that's just because of some permitting issues with the Department of Agriculture and whatever. So um, tortoises, lizards, snakes, um, we do have a few amphibians, you know, frogs and salamanders and the like. And then um, tarantulas and various species of insects. Right. So yeah, cool. we, all the creepy crawly things, they're the things I like. Well, my goodness. Well, I want to say thank you so much for bringing these animals, all of them. And thank you so much for your help today. I'll let Absolutely. you put 
came to bed while I introduce our last guest. Sweet. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much, Bill. Let's hear it for Bill Hayward and the Animal Ambassadors. Awesome. Well, we have one more presenter for us today, and I'm really excited about this. Um, you know, when we talk about science, and for those of you who are studying science, I mean, science is really the exploration of the natural world. And we've talked about things like chemicals, we've talked about physics, we've talked about the animals, but we don't want to leave out one really essential piece, and that is the land. Um, and so to talk about the land, we were thinking, what other connections? You know, when we opened this semester and this academic year, we were talking about the connections between us, the connections among us. And so what we were thinking is, how, what other connections can we make? And some of you may know that it is Native American Week here, and so we really have found an, an absolute gem. We have an elder from the indigenous population who's going to speak to us about herbalism and about some of the uh, human science aspects of the land of the Southwest, the land all around us. So with that, I would like to welcome to the stage Bertram Savadawa. Bertram, thank you so much for being here. What a pleasure it is to have you on campus. Thank you for taking time to share with us today. Yeah, I really enjoyed you know, the presentations here. I can't compare to all what's been presented. <laughs> I don't have no props or anything no. to utilize, but... That's okay. You're going to talk to us about the essential elements of us, but can you tell us just a bit before I turn the stage over to you about yourself? Okay, well, yes, I am uh, from Hopi lineage. So when you have the, the, the boa, the Hopis do perform a snake dance. Ah, right. So there's that interaction you know yeah. with, the, with the serpents with the snakes uh even in our culture of hopi we have a turtle shell rattle mm. so maybe just an ancestral teaching understandings on that shell of the turtle if you notice on the inner perimeter of the shells there's a number of the squares that are 13. Mm. and in ancestral times or other world cultures an ancestral year comprised of 13 moons mm which, you know, we now follow a 12-month Roman calendar yeah. with our uh, year cycle. Right. And then with the moon, astronomical teachings, 29.3 will be like the common day-night teaching understanding of the moon cycle. But you have on the outer perimeter of that turtle shell, 28 squares, which is kind of a common number for the moon cycle. Wow. So this is just like part of understanding the connections, you know, that we have with, you know, nature. Beautiful. With the elements. But um, my mother is Hopi, and Hopi is a matrilineal culture from northeastern Arizona. So this was a type of mini vacation to come out here to Cedar City. First time on campus, and I really enjoy it and like it. So when the introduction came with your assistant, Amelia, that this was a uh, Harry Potter hall. I mean, it really, <laughs> it really does resemble then all the presentations that was done here. Yeah. I mean, yeah it's, uh, really gives that <laughs> character to it. Thank but you. my father is patriarchal culture of the Wallapai and have a Supai, which are actually kind of affiliated with the Paiutes that are one of the neighboring yes. yeah. uh, tribal cultures that are here right. in Cedar City. So those are my two lineage that I have of uh, inner tribal lineage here. Wonderful. And then just with the Hopi people, you know, continue your education. You know, that's, you know, your big backbone that, you know, it's going to take you into you know, the world out there. Even I, uh, you know, coming onto this campus, you know, everything was just flashback, you know, when I was in college as yeah. well, too. Yeah. And so even though you gave that description of being an elder, I kind of like still don't really take it on too much because, you know, you're still young at heart. And so <laughs> you're always going to be <laughs> having those young feelings. What a perfect attitude. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the introduction. I'll turn the stage over to you to, to share with us some of the botanical uh, things that you've uh, become such an expert on. Thank okay. you. Okay, well, actually, it might be taking away secrets. You know, like when you were having the wireless light, you know, when you're on carpet, and, you know, when you do your friction of your feet, you can have that spark. So, you know, you have the electricity going through, you know, your body when you were holding the, the, um, the light bulb. And you know, that's just kind of an understanding that, you know, people 
might be born naturally with certain gifts. You might have that intuition, or say if you're in a relationship, you might feel the other individual's emotions. So there is like a connection that you make with some other person. And even with myself, I'm not per se, say, a medicine person, but you know, visually you can see between my hands, you know, there's nothing. But if you didn't know how and understand, say, how to create some type of energy, you know, it is there. Or even in my time of upbringing, going to elementary school, you know, now everybody has laptops. Everybody's on the keyboard. But back in my time, there was pencils. So even just that visual, when you're holding that pencil and you're waving it, it gives that visual that it's bendable, that it's movable. But it's just all an understanding, you know. Ancestors already had that type of energy. When you mentioned about Tesla, you know, they already knew there was some type of energy being formed, take it in. And it's just in this, now this understanding with the sciences, it just further, further gives, you know, that understanding. Uh, but for myself, in our Hopi culture, it's a gender knowledge of actually learning and understanding of what I call the plant life, of uh, ethnobotany. <clears throat> and it was through my late grandmother that maybe she was inadvertently exposing and teaching me of the understandings of the, the plants and the herbs, which could be both medicinal or edible, you know, and basically, you know, to survive in, in the land or in the native concepts, you know, Mother Earth will provide. So you would have a knowledge of what are edible plants, what will be medicinal or healing. Uh, in a sense, you know, modern descriptions are given from our elders, you know, that we've all had a disconnect to the earth, to nature. And even uh, when the elders view and see our younger generations, you know, one of those predictions as a prophecy was mentioning that one day we'll be speaking with our hands and fingers. So when I was mentioning about the laptop, you know, we're communicating in that invisible web you know, with the emails, with the texts, and all the documentation that we're doing is all, you know, being all programmed within our, our laptop. But, you know, you have elements of stones, you know, which diamonds are part of that understanding that are little uh, bits of the diamonds that are within, you know, our laptops. Uh, but anyways, with stones, with the plants, you know, they all, you know, are part of healing where you do notice and see a lot of people have the bracelets with all the different types of stones on them. So they have their own you know, healing properties uh, with the different stones. And then myself from our state of Arizona, we have by, quite a bit of the turquoise. So it's part of that understanding, whatever you're connected to onto your body, you know, it'll help with bringing that energy within you. And just for the town name that you are here, in Cedar City, the cedar trees are also a type of medicine. Uh, what descriptions are given of saying smudging or burning of the cedar or even of the sage. You know, it does keep away the bad karma or the bad vibes. Uh, again, with all the kind of the tunes with the Star Wars theme, you know, it'll be that, you know, that karma force field to protect you you know, away from the bad negative vibes. But also, you can boil that, the green leafery of all the tree, you can boil it and it helps with the cleansing. It, you know, cleans out your bodily fluids and even with that liquid, you could even utilize it as a steam bath. And that will definitely help with, you know, opening up your pores and sweat out, you know, a lot of the other negative aspects out of your body and that's what would be pertain to what they would refer to as a type of uh, ceremonies that they call the sweat or the sweat lodge from other cultures and so you know those are part of that type of you know in a sense you know now we would describe it as being that you know aromatherapy you know when we're growing up yeah you, there are certain tastes or smells that you have grown with or, you know, certain types of foods you're fond of, when you smell that certain aroma, you know, oh, you know, they're making spaghetti or, oh, you know, they're cooking some meat. 
grilling it. But, you know, it's just the senses that you have. Uh, even in the areas uh, that we have did a documentary about some of the video of uh, documentaries for the plants. Uh, back in June, we were in the Spring Creek area. So in this particular area, you have sage, as I was talking about another type of uh, smudging that would be done. But with the sage, in a certain way you prepare it, it actually will help to take discolorations off of your skin when you are bruised or have the sprained ankles or knees, any, any part of the body, that it will help to take off that discoloration off of your skin. But it'll be helpful, you know, to in the healing process. And also the pine sap, the cedar sap as well, would be part of those ingredients that we now know as the salves, uh, tinctures that will help out with uh, healing. So just that common understandings of what could be utilized with the healing. Uh, even uh, with arts and crafts of the basketry, you got the willow branches that would be found along the creek area from the water sources. But then you would have even the sumac berries that would be edible during the springtime, but as well you would have the straight shoots of the limbs of that particular brush to made out of the weaving material of the wicker basket, which would be the containment or burden baskets that you would carry, you know, on your back or, you know, just in your hands. So those would be also part of the utilitarian uh, wares of the creation of the baskets from these particular materials. Uh, also, uh, what is known from my village, I come from the village of Old Araibi, there was actually 16 expeditions to my village under the individuals that led these expeditions, instructed by the actual Brigham Young, Thales Haskell and Marin Shelton, they came out to our Hopi area. And my ancestors were the ones that showed them how to prepare the ephedra plant, which is now commonly known in the Southwest as the Mormon tea, or here in your state, uh, Brigham's tea. And it was also a similar concept like the cedar. It'll help with cleansing, flushing out all the bodily fluids, uh, but similar to maybe it's like a caffeine, gives you that pepperzine within your body, give you rejuvenation or, you know, enhancement in your, your physical abilities. And so it was my ancestors that showed them how to prepare the ephedra plant. And then when they turned back and showed Brigham, you know, what they had found and seen from the Hopis, uh, which was fitting in the descriptions of the teachings that the Lamanites live on the rocks in northeastern Arizona, our villages, are situated on mesa tops of this Cretaceous Dakota sandstone. And so the masonry of that house, housing units, you know, really blended in with those house structures. Uh, but anyways, another connection to your state, in our Hopi language, since there are the Utes and the Paiutes that live in this particular area, in our language, it is the pronunciation of Yuta, Yutasino, the Ute people. So Utah became the state name of Utah for your area. And again, through, through Brigham's uh, history as well. So even though it's supposed to be of ethnobotany, but I gave you little tidbits of <laughs> information of history and with the interactions with the, you know, all what we've seen of the serpents and, and the turtle. But uh, myself, originally, I've been a tour guide. My company name is Ancient Pathways. I've been artisan, I've been uh, uh, have, having to attend different arts and crafts fairs and shows. I, my education background is museum studies. I've been exposed to different museum collections and artifacts about my Hopi people. That gave me the inspiration to carve in what's called the traditional style, the original forms of the carvings and the dolls prior to the modern realistic influence, which uh, a jokingly term I put in one of my uh, term papers of the comparisons of the two styles, which the modern contemporary counterparts are really focusing on the accuracies of carving the body anatomy, which are these supernatural beings in our culture that we refer to katsinas. And so the term that I gave to those modern contemporary counterparts were the proto Michelangelo action figures of that of the realistic renditions of the carvings that are done, and. Uh, 
my village that I come from has that very traditional upbringing and beliefs. And so it was just my view to <clears throat> carve in that traditional form and show my other fellow Hopi members that this was the originality, the original form of the dolls prior to that realistic influence. And so that's where I come from, but my family history, my Wallapai family name was Walker, but it sounds similar to an Ellis Island scenario. Wakayuta was the pronunciation of the Wallapai family name, and the U.S. government did not know how to accurately spell that, gave the labeling of Walker to my family name. So my natural birth name was Bertram Walker when I was growing up, and when I actually did a Google search of that name, there is a teacher in New York that <laughs> has that name of Bertram Walker. And Tsabatawa in our Hopi language is a translation to winter solstice. Tsaba is short and Tawa is father son. So as you understand now the winter days, they're much more shorter. The short path of the sun. And so that's uh, as an art market tactic since I did a lot of Hopi imagery in my paintings, drawings, illustrations, and the carvings that I do. Um, I just make, as an art market tactic, to make my name Hopi-ish, so I replace my Walker name with uh, Sabatawa. And being a guide, listening to other language word pronunciations, ironically in Hebrew, Saba is a, a translation of a slow female turtle. So I'm not a female, but maybe at times I might have that procrastinating spirit. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Bertram. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. Yeah, and again, thank you very much for allowing me to come to your facility, be a part of this, you know, uh, gathering here. Because, you know, again, nature, Mother Earth provided, you know, again, it's still expanding to the technology of sciences. It's, you know, common understandings of once when you have the knowledge and know-how to interact, to, to live off the land, you know, it's there. So exactly as I shared about the disconnect, now everybody's going back into the yeah. natural remedies, the ways of yes. healing. Everything from the meditations, you know, from all this self-isolation, quarantining, right. it's now the time everybody comes back out anew. Well, I want to thank you so much for bringing it all full circle uh, and, and the connections that you made with the electricity and with the animals and to share your knowledge. I feel like we've only scratched the surface. I hope to have you back. And for anybody who's interested, we are going on a Humanities in the Wild walk today at 4.40 um, at the Rainbow Canyon uh, Trailhead. If you want more information about it, come find me afterwards. Uh, Bertram and our own Jason Kaiser will be talking about both the geology and some of the plants and herbs as we uh, take a very short walk, just about a mile to the petroglyphs. So it's right here in town. If you're interested, um, please email me or come find me afterwards. Uh, and if you want to hear more from Bertram, we would love to share more in your knowledge. And so I understand even the radio interview. Yes, yeah, and also cool. on the radio today at 3 yeah. p.m. So there's more to carry on the conversation. Yeah. But with that, I want to say thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you to the science audience. You guys rock. See you next week.